Hey everyone, this is Josh McIntyre, also known as Chain Toots. Uh, really excited to be a part of DEF CON again this year and some of the great virtual content uh, that's happening as part of the Blockchain Village. So first I want to extend my thanks to uh, Ajit, Ron, Nathan, and everybody that's uh, doing all the hard work to put together uh, the Blockchain Village again this year. Today, I'm going to be talking about subtle and not so subtle ways to lose your cryptocurrency. This is going to be kind of a broad overview talk on some of the most common ways I'm seeing people get stolen from in my work doing tech education in the space. So first, a little bit about me, I have to give you an idea of what, the perspective that this talk is coming from. I'm a software engineer by trade, so I'm not directly a security professional, but I'm really interested in security and cryptocurrency because uh, I think you know building secure software, empowering people through technologies is a very important thing. Uh, and on the side, I run a tech education project called Chain Toots. So I build free and open source tech education content around cryptocurrencies, blockchains security and other computer science topics. Personally, I'm getting really tired of meeting people after they lost money. People that are coming to me through my videos that uh, got scammed or made a mistake and uh, lost some amount of cryptocurrency. I have a goal of helping more people stay safe before something bad happens to them in cryptocurrency. It's such a young industry and I want to be a part of the education efforts that are going to help people from losing money to scammers and thieves. The, the reality of this technology that we're all working with is it's a very, very powerful technology, uh, but it's also very vulnerable in that way if you don't use it carefully. Cryptocurrencies have irreversible transactions. And that's a really desirable property for us, right? We want money that's not censorable, that can be sent around uh, to anyone in the world, uh, that's decentralized and uses secure public key cryptography. Uh, the problem is, is that thieves and scammers uh, can and do take advantage of this if people aren't careful. So what I want you to get out of this talk is kind of an idea of the most common attack vectors and really basic common sense mitigation techniques. Uh, this talk isn't really presenting any original research on cryptocurrency security. Rather, this is coming from a tech educator perspective. What I actually see happen to my viewers and, and my listeners and people that I interact with doing this work. And what I want to give you is some insights and some new ways of thinking about crypto security that you can take back to the products that you're building your users, your companies, your interest in the cryptocurrency space. I just want to give everybody kind of a fresh perspectives and some bullet points that will be helpful in preventing future problems. So what's kind of a broad overview of what I want to talk about? Some of the different classes of attacks that uh, we are seeing as a crypto industry. Uh, the first one that we're going to go over is the one that's often the most powerful and um, seems to be a very common mechanism, and that's of social engineering. So that's just tricking people into giving up their cryptocurrency or their keys in some way. We're going to talk about some interesting malware threats that are out there in the wild. We're going to talk about uh, the unfortunate reality of user error with a powerful technology. We're going to talk about bad security hygiene practices. Uh, some of these things are things that carry over a lot to other areas of information security, whether it's a crypto exchange account or your email account. And we'll talk lastly about a few wallet implementation problems that have happened. Some of this may seem like common sense to, to you, the listener, right? Uh, we're industry professionals, but I, I want to hit home the point with this talk that these are all ways in which very real users, real people, get wrecked. With cryptocurrency. I want to talk about fixing that. I want to talk about simple common sense things that may seem like totally obvious to us as people that are computer science professionals or other professionals working in the crypto space. But let's talk about ways to make this digestible and easy for everyday people so that as cryptocurrency gets broad adoption, 
uh, we have less and less people getting stolen from in these sort of interesting ways. So social engineering number one. One of the biggest ways people get stolen from is fake support, uh, fake wallet support, fake Coinbase support, uh, social engineering scammers posing as a support channel for a legitimate company. Uh, these are examples that I found actually out in the wild. These are, these are real screenshots of, uh, for example, a fake KubeKey watch wallet website. This came up uh, actually high in the search results for KeepKey. Uh, so this type of attack vector is fairly straightforward. Uh, we know in cryptocurrency that your seed phrase or your private keys are what grant direct access to uh, the coins in the sense that if you have the private key, you can sign a new transaction to transfer that cryptocurrency to an address uh, that somebody else controls. So that's how you do value transfer at a basic level in uh, the world of Bitcoin. So this attack is to trick the user into giving up access to the seed phrase so the attackers can sweep those funds out to a wallet that they control. And they do this by uh, targeting public channels by which people often interact with crypto companies. So for example, Twitter or Reddit uh, where companies like Shapeshift have a, a presence. Uh, these scammers will try to pretend to be a support official from one of those companies and get them into giving up access uh, to their seed phrase. This is some kind of non-custodial wallet. So for example, a KeepKey hardware wallet uh, or Atomic mobile wallet, or sometimes to uh, trick them into giving up two-factor codes uh, so they can initiate a password reset and take over an exchange account. I see this really commonly on, for example, the Coinbase subreddit. Uh, if you post that you're having trouble with your Coinbase account, you will like immediately get a bunch of DMs from fake Coinbase support people trying to trick you into giving access to your exchange account so they can clean out whatever is there, uh, buy more with your bank account, send it to themselves. So what are some simple countermeasures for this? Uh, we need to warn people that interact with crypto services on a regular basis that no legitimate support is going to ask for something like 2FA codes or seed phrases. Uh, so if you're building a crypto wallet, if you're building an exchange service, whether it's decentralized or centralized, uh, we should have common sense warnings like this as part of our normal UX interaction. Social engineering number two, which is a very popular thing that I encounter because I interact with a lot of uh, crypto accounts on social media, is impersonation. So somebody pretends to be Andreas Antonopoulos or Roger Veer or the Crypto Tutor or even, I have seen, Chain Toots, uh, trying to get them in some way to uh, either give up access to keys or exchange accounts or more generally leading users to fake investment websites and trying to get them to send cryptocurrency directly to a scammer controlled address. Uh, a lot of times these websites, they're very easy to spot if you're somebody with experience in the space, but they are very convincing. So somebody like fake Roger will send you to this great uh, new trading algorithm website that he is building and uh, really, it's just a front to get you to send cryptocurrency. They're just modern look and feel UX websites uh, that at the end of the day are displaying a Bitcoin or Ethereum address and trying to get you to send an irreversible transaction to that address. Again, uh, countermeasures here are fairly straightforward. It's uh, awareness, spreading awareness of the irreversibility of crypto transactions. So knowing that if you send coins off to somebody, um, that transaction can't be taken back. And um, awareness of what these types of common scams look like in impersonation tactics. A really simple but really powerful example of this is Andreas Antonopoulos' Twitter bio, which says, beware of giveaway scams. So someone that's new to the space, that's coming to interact with someone like Andreas, sees very clearly a warning about a common type of scam. Right, this warning has probably saved real people from uh, being stolen from. Uh, 
uh, it's a simple message, but it goes a long way. These kinds of social engineering, like doubling scams, right? Elon Musk is giving away Bitcoin, uh, send half of Bitcoin here and you'll get double back. If we as uh, people in the space that are, you know, maybe some of the first people that a newcomer interacts with uh, have these types of warnings on our bios or things like that, that's a really useful way of warning people uh, that these scams occur. And again, too, I think just making people aware that one of the powerful but um, potentially dangerous parts of cryptocurrency is the fact that uh, transactions are irreversible, right? This is not your credit card. There is no chargeback. So make sure uh, that you are aware of that and uh, know that when you send crypto to somebody, you have no recourse. So you need to be really careful before you send off that transaction. So now we're getting into some of the more subtle ways that people lose cryptocurrency. And I think this one is really, really fascinating. These are malware threats, right? So computer viruses are just about as old as computers themselves. And uh, one of the new and interesting ways that people will try to steal is to uh, not only gain access to identity information like credit cards or social security numbers, but better yet, get direct access to cryptocurrency, which is a very uh, sort of uh, liquid thing that you can take from somebody and they will have no recourse to get it back. One of the interesting ways in this is happening is something called clipboard swaps or copy-paste buffer swaps. So this is a, a piece of malware that could get on your um, device, like your computer, through any number of means, right? File sharing, um, you know, clicking on sketchy links and emails. And what this uh, type of malware will do is it will detect a Bitcoin or Ethereum or another cryptocurrency address in the clipboard buffer. So crypto addresses are a little bit unwieldy at this stage, right? There are you know, 30 to 50 character um, addresses. They're not something that you can type out really. It's, it, it's cumbersome to deal with. And so one of the most common ways to send yourself cryptocurrency or to send somebody else cryptocurrency uh, besides using a QR code is to just copy and paste an address. If I want to send cryptocurrency from a uh, exchange account to my cold storage wallet, you know, I'm going to go into some user interface for that wallet and copy and paste that address into Coinbase to create that transaction. And what this type of malware will do is it will use something as simple as a regular expression to detect that and replace the legitimate address that you, the user, are trying to send to with the attacker's address. So what will happen then is when you send off that cryptocurrency, instead of it going to my cold storage wallet, it's going to go into the attacker's wallet because I copy and pasted an address and didn't think about uh, double, triple checking that address. Uh, this example on the screen here is a homebrew uh, example, educational demo of one of these clipboard swapping uh, types of viruses that I cooked up in about 30 minutes, right? This is not a complex piece of software uh, to develop but it can be really, really powerful if you get it on somebody's machine. You know, mine was uh, meant to be educational, it was written in a language that you normally wouldn't use to write uh, actual malware. Um, it, it's called Adderjack and it's available on my GitHub if you wanna kinda of take a look at what this sort of code looks like. Now this other example here that's on the screen is a screenshot of a virus scan that a real client that reached out to me gave me. Somebody that I met online actually had this happen to them, where they were trying to send cryptocurrency, uh, which is some kind of Ethereum token, to their own wallet, and they ended up sending off about $2,000 worth at the time of crypto to the attacker. Uh, and it looks to me like he got that malware on his computer through uh, file sharing. So he wasn't careful about the health of his daily driver device that he was using to send and access cryptocurrency and it resulted in him losing money uh, through one of these clipboard scams. So again, uh, as I said, I made a educational demo of this in about half an hour 
and have even added on a little bit of sophistication to it. Um, but the real ones are much more sophisticated. The real ones will even do things where they will take a bunch of addresses from the um, HD wallet tree and try to get one that the first couple of characters closely resemble uh, the address that the user originally copied. So this really hit, hits home as a countermeasure the importance of double and triple checking that your addresses match the intended recipients. So especially if you're sending off a high value transaction, you should really check the whole address. But you know, at the very minimum, check the first five or six characters, and even more importantly, check the last couple characters. Because with a lot of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Litecoin, the last few characters include a um, cryptographically secure hash checksum uh, that it would take much, much more work for the attacker to generate that, although it's only a few bits, mind you, so it's not impossible um, to uh, make sure that that address is, is correct. Uh, and again, high value transactions or cryptocurrencies that don't have checksums like Ethereum, make sure you check the whole address. Make sure you check uh, beginning, middle, and end so that you know the um, intended recipients, including yourself, is going to get the cryptocurrency and not some attacker. And another thing that I don't have on this slide here is, of course, just device health, right? You should have some type of antivirus protection on your devices that you're using to access crypto. Uh, you don't have to have one that's a resource hog that like live scans all the time, but like make sure you keep up with uh, your device health, right? Consider, if you're doing a lot of high-value crypto transactions, having a dedicated device just for cryptocurrency. So if you uh, do perhaps encounter a um, website or a file that ends up on your machine that has this kind of malware in it, it won't affect your uh, crypto device. So just think about these things and be careful. Uh, we should again educate users that crypto transactions are irreversible and you must be careful to double, triple check what you're doing. So user error, this one is always a bummer because people make mistakes. We're human beings, even those of us that have been in this space forever, screw up sometimes. And uh, it's fairly common uh, that I meet individuals that have made a mistake such as sending cryptocurrency to the wrong cryptocurrency address. A very common one that I see is um, Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash or more commonly the reverse. Somebody sends Bitcoin Cash to a Bitcoin address uh, in some wallet that does not support Bitcoin Cash, such as the Cash App. There's also further complications in the fact that although Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, uh, because Bitcoin Cash is a fork, they share an address format, but there are some versions of addresses now in Bitcoin, such as segregated witness addresses, that are not compatible with the Bitcoin Cash network. So even if the user does something like they send Bitcoin Cash from their Coinbase account to their cold storage Bitcoin wallet address, if they grabbed a SegWit address from their cold storage wallet, even though they have the private key, they may not be able to get the money back without the help of a Bitcoin Cash miner. And the ability to even do that has um, kind of been off and on as Bitcoin Cash has made changes to their protocol. In a lot of cases that I see, somebody will send Bitcoin Cash from their wallet to a Bitcoin address on a custodial exchange like Coinbase or Cash App, and they are completely screwed in that case, right? Not only is it maybe a SegWit address, but if Cash App and Coinbase are doing what they should be doing as uh, custodial exchanges, nobody there is gonna have direct access to the keys needed to work in manual recovery. So that money is effectively gone forever and locked. So this isn't an attack, right? But this is a very common way in which I see people make irreversible mistakes. And of course, the countermeasures are again very similar to the malware issue, which is you should be double, triple checking that the address and the intended cryptocurrency are correct before you finalize a transaction. Before you hit send, sign that transaction and broadcast it to uh, the crypto network that applies, you should make sure that you have the right cryptocurrency and the right address. 
one of the things that uh, bothers me about a lot of wallets is they do nothing in their user experience to educate users about this. Wallets are pretty good these days about saying, hey, here's your 12 to 24 word seed phrase. Make sure you back it up and keep it somewhere safe and never give it to anybody. Uh, because you must have this to restore access if you drop your phone in the toilet or you know your uh, car burns down with your hardware wallet in it. But something I see almost no wallets do is warn their users uh, about the irreversible nature of transactions and about double triple checking that the address and cryptocurrency are correct. I think, in my opinion, as a software developer, every wallet UI UX should have a warning like this, especially for really common ones like Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin Cash now has a different address format called Cash Adder that's the most commonly used. It still, of course, retains backward compatibility uh, with normal base 58 check Bitcoin addresses because that uh, address format isn't even really uh, reflected at the protocol level. It's, it's a wallet UX thing and how the uh, public key hash is encoded. I think it would be really great if wallet makers, wallet software developers started saying a warning if you try to send Bitcoin Cash to a non-cash adder address. Hey, user, are you intending to send this money to a uh, Bitcoin Cash address that looks like this? Right? It's a very common uh, issue that happens that people send it to the wrong type of uh, address. Make sure that this is correct. This is a simple uh, UI thing uh, that's just really just like a text box or, or, or a dialog box that could help save people from making this costly and irreversible mistake. So let's talk security hygiene practices. This is something in the information security world that is uh, constantly evolving, right? I may be saying something here that is not entirely correct based on the latest professional guidance. So, you know, always listen to your friendly neighborhood information security professional. Uh, but this is a big, big issue in the cryptocurrency space, particularly with exchange accounts. It's one thing if you screw up and you have a bad reused password that gets leaked in a data breach and accidentally gives someone access to your Facebook or Instagram accounts. It's another thing entirely when your password or 2FA hygiene is bad and somebody is able to get into potentially your crypto life savings sitting in Coinbase or Binance or Gemini. So this is something that not only should people do for their entire digital lives, but should be especially cognizant of when it comes to cryptocurrency. I have a couple demos that I'm linking to here. Uh, one is called Entropal, which is just a nice little hardware demo and a little command line utility as well uh, for di generating diceware passwords, which is a way of getting uh, much easier to type passwords uh, that also have a high degree of entropy to them. And Passperms, which is really just a basic uh, demo of the math behind password cracking and in general shows why length is better than complexity, such as adding a bunch of symbols to a password, and the effect that increased length has on password cracking times in the event of a data breach. So I hope perhaps these could be useful tools that you could uh, reuse and show uh, people when you're doing InfoSec education. So this type of attack is something like the user reuses an insecure password, so something that's short and easy to break with a password cracking utility like Hashcat or John the Ripper, and it's uh, being reused between uh, different accounts on the internet. So an exchange like Coinbase, a web wallet like blockchain.com, and some breach of some other website exposes this password uh, that the uh, attacker then cracks. So the countermeasures for this, it's really, really important to not reuse passwords. This is something that we talk about all the time as tech professionals. Every website that you visit should have a unique password, which prevents one breach from affecting other websites. The other thing is, is you should use long passphrases that are comprised of things like sentences, random words, or better yet, 
completely randomly generated, you know, alphanumeric, maybe with symbols if you want to pass phrases, and the use of secure password managers to store all this information. The reason most people reuse passwords is because we as people can't remember passwords for 50 websites, right? If you're a tech nerd like me, you might have upwards of 100 different websites that you visit with varying degrees of frequency. So encouraging people to use things like encrypted password managers prevents password reuse. And it also allows people to have really strong, high entropy, randomly generated passphrases that would be a complete pain to remember or even type, and just have those things be auto-filled through the password manager. If you own a crypto-related website, if you're a developer, insist on whatever the industry standard is for user passwords. Like, just do not allow people to, you know, have Hunter2 as their password. Enforce password length requirements. Uh, and again, you know, I'm not an information security professional necessarily. So what I'm saying is, is find out what the industry standard guidance is and enforce it. And if I had to come up with a general rule myself, I would say make sure passwords are at least 16 to 20 characters uh, and preferably as random as possible. Don't allow your users to mess this up if you're building a crypto related service. It's going to make it that much more secure for them uh, if they have the designer of the website or the designer of the wallet looking out for them and saying, hey, it's really important that your password is long enough, unique, uh, and not stored somewhere in plain text. Security hygiene number two, and this is another big one, is two-factor authentication. SIM swaps have been a plague in the cryptocurrency space. So this type of attack is when an attacker knows that a user of some exchange account or service, like a, like a, a blockchain.com web wallet, um, has SMS text message based two-factor auth and some exposed phone number. So attackers will work to try and get information on a target's phone number. Once they have that information, they will socially engineer the phone company, such as AT&T or Verizon or Sprint, into porting that number to a new device that they control. Once they have that phone number under their control in the form of a, a SIM card, they will initiate a password reset against the target service, so Coinbase or Gemini or Binance. They can then intercept the two-factor auth code and do uh, the password reset because the 2FA code has been used to prove the identity of what should have been the legitimate user that forgot their password. So countermeasures for this, and this is already starting to be implemented across the industry, is only allowing app-based, such as TOTP, so this is your um, Microsoft, Google, Duo, Authenticator apps, or better yet, security key-based two-factor authentication. So using something like this, a YubiKey device, or even uh, a lot of hardware wallets like the KeepKey will act as uh, U2F or FIDO 2FA devices. So if you own a crypto-related website, don't even make SMS two-factor authentication an option. Uh, it's honestly easier as a, as a web developer to enable uh, something like TOTP anyway because you're just managing a seed rather than having to deal with how you, you know, send text messages to somebody like some subscription service or server infrastructure to do that. Just don't allow SMS 2FA. Really encourage people to use app-based 2FA and to use security keys. Also, you know, be the coolest by enabling, uh, again, hardware token 2FA on your websites. Not only is this more secure for the end user than even app-based 2FA, it's also easier. I hate going to websites where I have to pull out my phone and manually type in codes. Like, I gotta unlock my authenticator, unlock my phone, type in a six-digit code. With this thing, I go to the website, I my uh, password manager autofills the password and then I tap this and I'm in and I have a very secure setup in doing so. So we as an industry need to really encourage people uh, to have good hygiene when it comes to their two-factor. 
So the last interesting topic we'll talk about, I would say is the most subtle and the most difficult as an end user to prevent type of attack or compromise. And this is poor wallet implementations. I should say some of these are very complex and subtle attacks. And some of these actually are pretty to avoid, like the uh, pretty easy to avoid, like the issue of brain wallets. So examples of this that have happened for real in the cryptocurrency space are the Electrum phishing attack, where attackers exploited a vulnerability in the Electrum uh, Bitcoin desktop wallets and trick users into installing a malicious version of Electrum from the attacker servers instead of the legitimate Electrum servers. So, so the end user at some point had a legitimate Electrum wallet on their device. They were tricked um, via this exploit into installing a um, backdoored version of Electrum, which was able to read the private keys and sweep the funds to attacker controlled wallets. So this is something as an end user, right? Especially if you're a non-technical person, how do I avoid this? Well, unfortunately, although this is difficult for folks that aren't technical, the use of uh, well audited and reputable software is, is one thing that's, that's a step, right? Like use what other people in the community are using. If a brand new Bitcoin wallet just popped up on the app store today and it has 30 downloads, like maybe avoid that one for now, right? It could be a great new product. Uh, it could be open source, you know, but use something like Exodus, Coinomi, Bitcoin.com, something that has a reputation. Um, and you really need to, if you're going to use desktop software especially, learn how to do signature and hash verification. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass if you're not a technical person, but you should learn how to do this. Um, it's better for you to have to spend an hour learning how to use GPG and verify signatures and learning how to verify hashes and what the fuck a hash even is. Uh, than it is for you to lose thousands and thousands of dollars from downloading malicious software. So take your time with that. If you're using something that's like mobile, uh, you know, part of the mitigation effort is just downloading things through the app store because Google and Apple through their app stores do things to try and ensure that there isn't malware or malicious software uh, coming into their official app download stores. That's not foolproof, but it is one step better than downloading a random APK off of some website that's like, hey, Bitcoin wallet, it's free, you know, use that. Never use brain wallets or paper wallets. Uh, you know, brain wallets are the practice of hashing some user generated password into a key. Uh, those have been proven for many years now to be really insecure. Uh, Ryan Castellucci, who's an InfoSec professional, has done a, a really awesome DEF CON talk on cracking brain wallets. And it is super, super easy to steal from people that try and generate their own key entropy. Uh, like, don't do that. The one that's a little bit more difficult, and I, uh, I say difficult in that people still insist this is an okay practice, is paper wallets. So you visit some website like bit address or, or, or Litecoin address, you know, dot org or whatever, and it generates a key for you in the web browser and you print out a piece of paper that has the, uh, the public key hash, which is the address and the private key for it. So many people have been stolen from uh, by malicious versions of these websites that were backdoored into generating you know, keys that the attackers control. So they're just constantly sweeping out attacker, you know, uh, sweeping out user funds basically. Um, and you know, there's also pitfalls like potentially uh, poor cryptography used in JavaScript websites. That's a thing that happens. Uh, and I have gotten into arguments with people on Twitter that insist, bro, it's better for you to generate a paper wallet on litecoinaddress.com than it is to keep coins in an exchange. And in my professional opinion, that's just not true. Like you are better off keeping your $100 of Litecoin or Bitcoin in a legitimate exchange with good password and 2FA hygiene than you are generating a key off of some website. Like take 10 minutes to install Coinomi or Exodus 
uh, or Bitcoin.com or any other reputable mobile wallet to control your own keys before you generate a single key pair wallet. There's just so many things that can go wrong with change, with key generation. Don't do it. And I think, you know, we should kindly and professionally slap people uh, online that still promote paper wallets as a practice. It's just, it's, it's not something we should be doing anymore. So some final thoughts. Again, as tech professionals watching this and attending DEF CON, a lot of this probably isn't news to you. And that's kind of the point that I wanted to make with this talk, is these are common ways that very real people lose money in this new technology, uh, in this new ecosystem every single day. The people that steal cryptocurrency using these techniques do so because it is very effective and profitable for them. And most of these attacks, again, are mitigated by common sense, relatively non-technical countermeasures. So, you know, you may have not learned something really cool today about uh, the latest in password cracking technology, but I think uh, you probably have learned uh, a good set of bullet points that you can take back to your companies, uh, your open source wallet projects. Whatever you're building out there, I want to encourage people to take um, education like this and to think about new ways of making security information digestible to everyday people. I think we, especially in this incredible new industry with this super empowering technology, uh, we have kind of a, a professional duty to educate users, uh, to implement sound user experiences, to build secure software, and develop new best practices. Cryptocurrency is 10 years young at this point. Uh, so not only can we kind of share things that have emerged in the last few years from these common exploits, like everybody that's watching this talk, I think even myself included, we have some opportunities to create new best practices, uh, whether it be through software security, through user experiences, through tech education content, any innumerable ways that you can participate in the blockchain ecosystem, we can do a part to build better security. Uh, so as more and more people, as mass adoption comes into our ecosystem, we're ready to help uh, people embrace this technology without fear in the way that now, you know, people, everyday people can go on the internet and buy something off of Amazon without having to worry about their credit card being compromised. We're not there yet as an industry, but we can be if we put in a solid effort to make this happen. So again, if you're watching this, um, take these bullet points back home to whatever you're building. Uh, you know, build a new security ecosystem for cryptocurrency. Uh, we don't want people like Senator Elizabeth Warren to say that this is all uh, the shadowy underground built by shadowy super coders, right? We want to show the world uh, what this technology can do in a positive way. So go out, build secure experiences, enable 2FA, please, and I want to thank you guys very, very much for watching this talk. So of course, uh, this talk is pre-recorded this year. Uh, I want to encourage folks to reach out to me with questions. Uh, you know, I'm not just saying we would love to hear from you in the corporate way. I genuinely love when people reach out to me and talk to me with feedback. Um, anything that you think I can do better as an educator, uh, questions that you have for me about what I've seen in blockchain security, uh, or, you know, if you have ideas for uh, other things that we can be doing together to help build out this ecosystem, I'm on Twitter at Chaintoots. That's a great place to reach me. Um, my website, Chaintoots.com, has a contact form, and I'm pretty good about uh, getting emails out to folks quickly. And I will be hanging out on the Defcore Discord, uh, DEFCON Discord this weekend uh, to watch talks, interact, answer questions. Uh, last point. All of my educational content, code, videos, articles, slides, are uh, licensed under Creative Commons and uh, permissive open source software licenses. 
Uh, so not only is reuse of this content allowed, uh, I would take it as a huge compliment if you take anything that I'm building and remix it, share it, get it out to people just with you know credit uh, to me as the original author. Uh, thanks again, and as always, I hope you learned something new with me today.